consistent. Like that, that is the, that is the nature of the position. So because of that, teams really have to go and get a guy every single year in the draft. Welcome into the Hot Read Podcast live from Indianapolis. We are here at the NFL Combine. It is day three. I'm your host, Easton Freeze, director of published content here at broadwaysportsmedia.com. We are also brought to you by the 440 Podcast Network, and I am joined in our studio here in Indianapolis, just outside Lucas Oil Stadium and the Indianapolis Convention Center, where Radio Row is at by producer JT. JT, how are you? I'm fantastic. Another day almost in the books here um, as we still have some of the uh, testing drills going on, but we thought we'd dip out of there to come do our show a little bit yep. early, get our thoughts in order. And uh, yeah, it was the first day of drills for uh, defensive linemen and edge players and linebackers. Yep, they got us kicked off with the physical activities inside Lucas Oil, the part of the combine that you think of when you think about the combine before we get started a couple of housekeeping things real quick if anybody watching us live could help us out by confirming in the chat on youtube whether or not you can see and hear us so that we know that everybody's good and that the chat works and that we're ready to roll if you are listening in post on the podcast feed or the youtube video version in the future just know that we are going live every single day here from indianapolis this is show three of seven every single afternoon slash evening for the next uh, four four days after today. So you can catch us live, talk with us in the chat during the show, ask any questions you might have. We really, really appreciate you tuning in, whether it is live or after the fact. Just waiting an, an extra split second here to make sure that the chat is working. We get the all good there. Perfect. And with that, we can get rolling on what was a very, very good day JT, as you said, we had the physical activities kicked off with the athletic testing in Lucas Oil Stadium this afternoon. It was three o'clock. We had the linebackers, edge players, and the defensive linemen do their testing. They are still currently testing for the next hour or so. We caught the beginning of that and decided it was time to do a show. So we're going to talk about a number of the highlights and lowlights from the testing today, but there's a handful of things we, we may have to talk about a day later on tomorrow's show that, that may be happening right now that we miss out on. We focused in on the defensive linemen and the edge players because in terms of the Titans and our coverage of, of them and their team needs, that's that's the more likely group for the Titans to be interested in, especially higher in the draft with some of these top prospects. But we're not going to totally disregard the linebackers. We'll pay them some attention later on. Before all of that happened today, though, we got to speak this morning with all of the cornerbacks, which we previewed on yesterday's show. If you didn't see it, go and check it out. We talked about the interviews for all the defensive linemen and edge players we talked to today. We talked to and interviewed the cornerbacks today. I believe that that means they're testing tomorrow, right? Yeah, Is it going? I believe so. Yeah, okay, I think should. it's going in that order. I'm just assuming, but that makes the most sense. So we got to talk to them today. There are a ton of them, and they crammed all of the interviews. Into one hour. Into one hour, <laughs> and they tried to do it every 20 minutes. Very regimented and clean. They also then sent us an email this morning, bright and early, saying, hey, by the way, guys, this is the NFL speaking. Um, the cornerbacks that are supposed to go today at very specific times may or may not be able to do that because their medical testing is right before that. And I don't, I don't know if you've ever been to a doctor's office, JT, but um, it, it's not a They're place. not the quickest people in the world. Well, they're not the quickest, and they're not known for – their times being anything more than a suggestion. Yeah. So that's uh, that's that's the boat we were in. We had to wait around for some guys. It kind of threw off our planning. Luckily, though, we we did end up getting to uh, dividing and conquering between the two of us. At least one of us got to pay attention to and take notes on almost every single cornerback we were interested in today. So we've got six or seven guys that we found the most interesting that we're going to chat about, share some of the highlights from those interviews, before we get into that, just a rundown of the show today, we will go through those interviews, highlights and lowlights. We've got uh, a couple of news topics we'll get out of the way here, probably at the very beginning, just to get those out of the way. And then we'll finish up with some of the best and worst from the athletic testing today and give you some thoughts there. I know yesterday we promised you that today we would have a video 
from the Combine NFL fan experience that we recorded this morning. We did end up recording that video at 9 o'clock this morning. We were met by NFL rep Jesse, who was awesome, super cool dude, very nice, very helpful. He showed us around out there, and it was it was not the best weather situation because yesterday we had a st- very strange, balmy day for a February day in Indianapolis, 75 degrees and sunny. This morning we were all out of bed after another late night. We're running on a lot of coffee, adrenaline, and I don't know, 12 total hours of sleep since we've uh, been here. Maybe 10 I, to 12. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go on the lower side, maybe nine to ten hours. Okay. But. I think we're just <laughs> into the double digits, but regardless, not enough sleep. Adrenaline and caffeine have been fueling us. Yep. And this morning it didn't feel great getting out there where it was 40 degrees relatively early, sun's behind the clouds. And we're trying to run 40 yard dashes. To be fair, the point of the video was to show how funny it is watching normal people do these things yeah. and how unathletic we are in particular, but the average person is, which we are two of. And uh, that was only amplified by the fact that we were a, a little bit uh, super tired and a little bit freezing our butts off and a lot bit stiff. Yeah. Well, Not a lot of stretching went on. Should have. <laughs> Really should have, but it didn't. Watching some of the footage back, I'd say two of the three uh, drills we did for the combine, I think we we both put a lot of effort into it. I know personally for the for the obstacle course one, I was just I was, I, I you know the, I don't know are, I didn't put my heart and soul into that. I, one. I I'm didn't not gonna either. Lie to you. you know, um, there's a couple people in Nashville media today who. I, I have to count my blessings because I could be feeling worse after last night. Well, you night. could be Buck Rising. I could be. Or Lucas Panzeca, um, but mostly Buck Rising. Yeah. <laughs> I could, but you know what? Who we've given a hard time all day. Yeah. Because um, um, we, I, just to let you behind the curtain, I was, I, I think I tweeted this this morning to Lucas, but Buck Rising of 1045, our buddy here, we've been giving him a hard time. We were texting him last night, like, hey, man, what's the move? Like, where are we going? It, half the fun with the combine is the scene of NFL executives, coaches, scouts, and then all the media members out on the town. A lot of uh, a lot of social meetings going on at restaurants and bars. A lot of shop being talked, and so we were getting in on that action. And I text Buck, and I'm like, "Man, what's the scene? What's going on?" This dude leaves me on red. The audacity, first of all. But if you know anything about Buck Rising, I guess it kind of checks out. It fits. It fits the mold. Uh, I just assume that he was so busy and or inebriated that he couldn't pay attention to my text <laughs> until but then, a certain time. <laughs> but then he texts me at 2 a.m., which I don't see until this morning where he's at and it, it's like okay well that's the night the buck hat and then and then we go on twitter and we see buck messing around with some of the other 104.5 shows talking about how he is alive but just barely so and it's really funny because it, we could have had a worse night and I guess it, is the moral I, of the story it was really funny because the bar that we left the last one that we went to last night uh he showed up there 15 minutes later i know we just missed him <laughs> we just missed him regardless so we'll, i mean buck, it, we will it's find a, you it's, before a, the it's, week's a, over. it's a good don't, thing and a bad don't, thing don't you worry right? or may, maybe you should worry because we're gonna find you yeah. Um, but all of this is a segue off the fact to uh, the fact of the matter here with our video from the morning. Yeah. We promised it to you today. You may still get it today, but not we'll not in this show. It's either going to be out tonight or tomorrow morning. Yeah, we will for sure play parts of it, some highlights on the show tomorrow. I promise you, it's very funny and you will enjoy it. But we are officially ten minutes into this. We've vamped long enough trying yeah. to get folks in here. If you are still watching. Two things you can do for us. Make sure you retweet, share, like, wherever you're watching this on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. If you can make sure you get it to anybody that you think might be interested in tuning in live, I'll consider it a personal favor. That's super, super helpful for us. And then if you're watching live, go over to the YouTube where you can watch me throw pens with your eyeballs and not just listen. But also you can leave comments in the chat and we want to hear from you any questions or comments you have as we go through some of these prospects. All right, JT, we have a couple of news items here. Not our typical MO to do our Titans news segment out of the gate, but because we have just a couple of things to address and then some deeper conversations to get into, how about we get into some Titans news? Yeah, let's run down the news here, starting with a tweet that Paul Kaharski put out earlier today, and he was talking with Greg Cosell about the Titans situation with the first uh, their first round pick at number 11 mm-hmm. right there. Um, and, and it really wasn't like a source, like source breaking. This is what he thinks, but he was just kind of talking, re- re- relaying Greg Cosell's yeah. opinion. And Greg said that he hadn't looked, a, this is concerning the top two. By the tackles. way, for, for any that might not know, if you follow the NFL, you should know who Greg Cosell is. If yeah. you don't, 
uh, we can pretend that you did it just go now and look him up nfl films he is a a, a patron saint of knowing ball dude knows ball yep. he's the best at what he does um and he's fantastic so what he says should be listened to yeah, yeah and so he said that he hadn't got a chance to look at peter skronsky yet however he has looked at paris johnson jr and would personally not take him with the uh, first pick with the Titans yeah, half, overall, which is right. uh, really interesting because that's where uh, me and you have been a little bit, but also the greater the Titans majority. fans have been clamoring for him to be the Absolutely first overall pick. And that we bring that up just because we talked about on yesterday's show that, hey, if the Titans explore other options in maybe free agency or through a trade, they, they might not use that first overall pick that they have, not first overall, but the first pick they have in the draft sure. on a offensive lineman. Well, they so might... it's interesting to me. It, sorry, were you finished? Yeah, I, I had a take brewing yeah. and just kind of went with it here. Yeah, all good. The, the, the thing about this, and when I saw that, I actually saw Paul talking to Greg, having that conversation from across the room. Didn't know what they were talking about, but then that tweet goes off and I wish that I'd gone over there like I thought about doing for a split second because I would have loved to have heard Greg's opinion if he had more to say. I'm sure that he did. I would love to go find him this week. We may have to do an on, on-site on interview with him and and chat a little bit about that. So that's a potential thing we might dive into for the show in the next couple of days. It made me look around because and do a little bit of research in the media workroom because this has been kind of the trend this week and a little bit last week as well, but just recently. The vibes, the general zeitgeist vibes surrounding our guy, Paris Johnson Jr., who, again, Titans fans are largely a fan of the Titans getting at 11. The more you see that he's become a really, really polarizing prospect. I, I'm seeing folks either really like him and think he's the bona fide tackle one of the, of the class and a guy that is going to be probably a starting tackle in the league for a long time. And, and then some folks are saying they, they just don't see it with him and they don't think he's going to be that bona fide stud that it's a real risk. And they absolutely, like Greg said, would not consider drafting him as high as right now he's projected to go. I, I went and looked at some other respected folks' opinions on this. And I, I went and read Dane Brugler's, it was a piece, I, I wish I could quote the exact piece. He's got so many written uh, pieces on The Athletic from the Combine already. I found one in which he talks about his opinion of the offensive line situation and Peter Skronsky, as well as Paris Johnson Jr. He's not as low on Johnson Jr. as some folks are, but in comparison to Skronsky, who a lot of Titans fans have, I think, again, in a group think fashion, myself as well, and there's it's not group, just because it's a group thing doesn't make it inaccurate. It just means it's it's the going theory that people are running with here. Skronsky is is a the best offensive lineman in this draft class bar none the problem is he's got really short arms he's gonna he's gonna measure in with arms at best in the 33 inch category and for those that don't know the general rule of thumb gatekeeping tackles in the nfl barring a handful of very rare exceptions nfl tackles need 34 inch arms or more simply because they need to have that reach to be able to contend with these six three six four six five defensive ends and edge rushers trying to come around the corner. And if you can't, as a, as a tackle, get your hands on their pads as well as they have their hands on your pads, it's like a boxer, man. You're out of luck if you're getting outreached like that, especially around the edge. So those guys typically get bounced inside. And so that's why Skaronsky has been viewed as this probably going to be maybe the next, maybe the next $20 million man at, at guard, but he's going to be an interior guy. He wants to play tackle. He's been very adamant about the fact that he wants to be given a chance to play on the outside. And Dane Brugler, who I love and respect his work, he thinks that Skaronsky is, I think he had him number six overall on his big board. He thinks he's by far the best lineman in this class. And he holds the, I guess, controversial take that Skaronsky should absolutely be given a chance on the outside. He should absolutely be considered a five positional flexibility prospect. And that makes him the most valuable line lineman in the entire draft, tackle, guard, center, or, or otherwise. And so I, I think there may be, at least for me, I won't speak for everybody, but I'm going to be doing a little bit more research on the top of the tackle draft. I feel like our preconceived notions along the lines of what we talked about yesterday, this time of year with the draft, it's very easy to feel like you have these guys figured out 
immediately. And then you do a little digging and you realize the order is going to switch. Your opinion is going to change. New information is going to lead you to think a little differently. And while I don't necessarily agree with the idea of drafting a guy at 11 that you don't know physically can play tackle, that is for sure a gamble. It is something that they're going to have to consider. I'm sure it's something they're already considering in the Titans front office. Yeah, and, and going off that, our second piece of news here is that uh, a friend of the show, Justin Mello, uh, came out today and said Quentin Johnson, in the currently consensus number one overall wide receiver. Now that's that's it's really different who you really ask, different, but the but majority, majority of number one receivers on boards are Quentin Johnson out of uh, TCU. He has interviewed formally with the Titans, which is a big which is a big thing because we've talked all week with all these prospects. Uh, everyone goes up and gives them questions. Did you meet with so and so team? Did you meet with the yes. Bengals? How about the Bucks? Who'd you meet with? Yes, I don't but know. but then it's informal. like formal. informal, formal. It's it's a it's kind of hard to distinguish. <laughs> very, right? it's very boring actually after and, a while. Yeah, it's, it's so, the but, worst but part of the question process, but it's it's necessary. But when so you when you get them to say that it's formal, then that's where you have the real answer to your question that everybody is looking for when right. they go up to these. Well, because podiums. teams only get a certain number of these formal interviews. They're set up by the league, by the combine. It's an official. You're designated a room. You go in. You can have coaches and executives and scouting department guys in there. You ask questions. You get, I think it's a 20-minute allotment for a certain – I forget the exact number of guys here they can they can do a formal interview with, but it's not it's not nearly all of them. It's not even half of them. It's, it's a small selection. And informal interviews – are it's not even interviews. It's really just did you meet with informally a team. That's just the team deciding to send a guy to chat with you in the hallway or walking down the stairs or – on the way to the bar at the end of the day or, you know, in the elevator that it's that kind of thing where it's not, it's not officially sanctioned by the league, but it's not technically breaking the rules. So whenever you hear a guy has met informally with a team, it means Jack squat. When you meet, when you hear that they met formally with a team, it still doesn't mean a whole lot, but it does mean the team, especially this time of year, this early, they've, they've got some preliminary interest in a guy, which means your your ears should perk up a little bit. Um, and there, there is going to be over the the rest of the week, slowly cobbled together the puzzle pieces of this formal meetings list for each team, which we'll we'll be focusing on who's formally met with the Titans. Is this the first guy we've heard of that has for sure formally met with the Titans? I believe so. Yeah. If not, he's one of only a couple. I've I've yep. not I, I've not heard a, a number of those. Frankly, if there were others, they've gotten lost in my brain because I've I've contained up here every yeah. formal and informal answer that and i've I'm heard sure which is a couple hundred that are of them, like so. top 10 guys who like their answers are yes i've met with the titans formally but it was it was kind of hidden in the fact of yeah i've met with basically everyone i got 10 more interviews tonight <laughs> well you know? and, and some of yeah. them some of them answer that way and i actually respect it it's yeah. frustrating for the the interviewer usually who is asking that question just trying to get uh you know to a video for their hometown Twitter scene yeah. or, or uh, uh, something that they can put in their article that's due by 3 p.m. But w- when they just say, you know, to the first question of did you meet with X team or who'd you meet with? They're just like, man, yeah, we, we, I'm meeting with everybody. I've already met with them or I'm going to meet with them. And it, it's gone really well. I, I'm enjoying meeting these teams. And then the just that shuts down the train for the rest of their. I, I'm a fan of that. We've gotten a couple of those from yeah. usually the bigger prospects. Yeah. yeah. Most notably, like Lucas Van Ness and some of those guys um, yesterday. Yep. However, that, that's kind of our Titans specific news that we had today regarding the first overall pick. So, and more and more as the combine comes down, it looks like that the Titans will be exploring all options for the for their pick at number eleven. They will be. And before we leave that topic, I'll say if anybody is watching us live, if you would mind maybe commenting your opinion on this. Um, it seems like the consensus, again, has been for a long time that Skaronsky, it shouldn't be considered as a tackle option for the Titans. The arms are just too small. It should be Paris Johnson. We want to hear your thoughts. So leave in the comments over at Broadway Sports Media's YouTube page. You can find this live stream in the comments of this live stream. We can uh, chat back and forth with you. So I'm, I'm curious, if you're listening live, what is your opinion on the Paris Johnson Jr. versus Peter Skaronsky debate? We'll continue to talk about that. If we get any responses throughout the show, we would we'd be happy to talk with you about that. Let's move on now. I think we can we can officially move into talking about these cornerback prospects that we got to meet with today, that we got to talk to 
overall a hectic period of the day, but a really good one. Yeah, I enjoyed I it. it went really well. Um, the the folks that you focused on mainly were, <laughs> let's see here. You you spoke with Christian yeah, we Gonzalez. Ba- we basically went. We got most of the top ten, maybe fringe third, fourth round guys, but most of them are going to climb up boards and exactly. end up in that second or third round conversation. I think the only two that we really didn't get to that we wanted to was um, Ringo. De- De- oh, yeah. Ringo. Uh, Devin Witherspoon, who didn't have any availability right. at all, he was like 15 minutes late to his spot, and yeah, then he stayed ro- around he for four minutes, and then dipped late, and then decided he was going to leave at his allotted time to leave. So yeah, fair and, enough. And, and then Joey Porter Jr. Just because we were at other ones getting good content there, and it, there was already a sea of people, but it's it, it wasn't really going to change what what a lot. I think we already knew who those. At least Devin Witherspoon and Joey Porter Jr. Especially, we already know kind of who those guys are, right. um, and there really isn't anything there that would have been too game changing. I think, but besides that, everybody else we kind of talked to today that we wanted to talk to. We did, and our focus was on guys that, like you said, are in that top ten that the Titans, if they were to go with a non-offensive lineman at eleven, could be considering. And then we were focusing mainly on guys in the. 40s, 50s, 60s, like we talked about yesterday, guys. And there were a couple more like in the, in the, you know, they may go in the 90s. They may go early day, th- day three, but mostly it's guys that the Titans could consider getting in the second or the third round. And before we talk about the individuals, I will say the prospect of the Titans drafting a cornerback in the second round at what, what did we decide it would be for the 42nd 42. pick? Yeah, yeah. The, at the 42nd pick. I I heard from a couple of people on Twitter today, and this is another great topic for us to chat with you all listening. So if you're watching live, I want to hear your opinions on this in the chat again over at Broadway Sports Media's YouTube page. You can find the live stream. I want to hear your thoughts and chat a little bit about whether or not you'd be supportive of the Titans considering a cornerback there at 42 overall. The responses I got from Twitter, which there were only a couple of them, but they were all unanimously against the idea of spending one of the Titans two day three picks on a cornerback, which I found strange, but the rationale was basically that this team needs a lot. And of all of the different position groups, the cornerback group is I think by far the youngest, if I'm not forgetting a position group. Um, And they're definitely the group that has had, the most capital invested in them in the last two, three, four drafts. And because of that, I think with some higher draft picks in, in, you know, Caleb Farley, who's not worked out Christian Fulton, uh, Roger McCreary, that that's kind of been the trend and it's been some mixed results for sure. And because of that, I think fans are more interested in getting guys from the draft that are at other positions, but I don't think that that's, necessarily the right perspective to have because simply put cornerback may be the position above all other positions that every single GM is looking to draft every single year. And that's really without fail because the cornerback position is a really tough one. It is super, super inconsistent year to year. It's very hard to predict success and guys go up and down. It's not like a lot of positions where you come in as a rookie your first year or two, you're pretty bad. And then you, reach your prime, you're a stud athletically on the field. Um, you, you you go pretty consistently for, you know, five, six, seven, ten years, and then you start to fall off. And it's this perfect arc of your storyline that is the NFL career. And and then and then you ride off into the sunset. Whereas cornerbacks more often than not will have years where, oh look, Jalen Ramsey is the best cornerback in the game. Oh, he fell off. He's this he's out of this prime. Oh, look at that. Then then the next year, he's good again. Um, It it is so scheme dependent. It is so fit dependent. It is so situation dependent. It is is really difficult, is my point. And and because of that, it it means there's a lot of turnover in the league. And you have guys that, because it's such a difficult position, and it really does take freaky athletes. I mean, there's an argument to be made outside of quarterback and maybe even equal to or above quarterback cornerback has long been considered one of, if not the toughest position on the field to play because you got to be sharp mentally and physically. You have to be a, in the peak of your prime athlete or else you can't hang unless you're a a real outlier. But how many 30 plus year old cornerbacks do you know that are still studs? 
Not a lot. Stephon Gilmore. Yeah. And that's again, inconsistent. Like that, yeah. that is the, that is the nature of the position. So because of that, teams really have to go and get a guy every single year in the draft, at least one, if not more. Oftentimes you see teams draft a second and a seventh, you know, they take a flyer or two. The, the idea that the Titans would get a guy this year in particular at 42 at cornerback, not only would it make sense in any year because I'm not ever surprised when a team drafts a cornerback, but I think it would make particular sense, JT. And tell me if you disagree. This year, the top of the second round, the beginning of day two, the value at the cornerback position is going to be higher, I think, than any other position group just because of how deep this class is and because of how many other positions, because of positional value, may go in the first round instead of cornerback, leaving a crop of like maybe 10 to 12 bona fide starting cornerbacks available for you in the second round. And I think that's going to be a run on the position. And that's what I was about to say. I think you, if you see a run on cornerback, you're going to see it in the early second round. We're going to see a lot of people probably moving around, trading up, trading down um, in that first couple of picks in the second round there, just because there, there are so many guys and just like not all of them can, can go in the, in the first round. Right. Listen to the, listen to this on the consensus big board at NFL mock draft database, the consensus board we reference. You've got the top three guys who are pretty solidified into that top three. Devin Witherspoon out of Illinois, Christian Gonzalez out of Oregon, and Joey Porter Jr. out of Penn State. All three of those guys are going to go top 10, top 15, unless something happens and one happens to slip. But those are the guys that are for sure going in the first round. They may all go in the top 10. Then after that, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 cornerbacks that are on the consensus board between the 24th overall guy and the 100th overall guy. They are, they are in the double digits between 25 and 99. And how many did I just say? One, two, three, 12. four, five. Yeah, 12. 12 guys between 24 and 99. Cam Smith at 24. Keely Ringo at 25. Devonta Banks at 33. Manuel Forbes at 36. Clark, Clark Phillips the third at 42. Tyreek Stevenson at 59. Q, uh, Q Blue Kelly. Do you know how to say the first part of his name? No, I KYU. Don't. Yeah. I think it's it's either Q or Caillou. I'm yeah. guessing, and I'm probably wrong on both counts. But Blue Kelly at 73, DJ Turner at 74, Julius Brents at 75, Eli Ricks at 87, Garrett Williams at 93, and Jalen Jones at 94. And that's all. That's those all, are all. That's all day three picks yeah, right there. Th that's all people that we haven't even seen at do their do their metrics and do their drills yeah, we, we, yeah the combine, we, we've talked to there, them there's there's a, there's a lot yet. of guys there that are going to shoot up that board who are around the 90 to 100 range athletic that, freaks that, that are just going to wow just tomorrow. going to yep. wow people and i think we did a good job today in assessing this this cornerback class of okay we we found guys who the titans if they really fall in love with them could take in the first round if the positional value is there we could they could take them in the second round or if they're still there in the third round they could fall there you know and, and sweep them up in the third round guys who were like around the 100 mark right and so with that let's let's dive into some of the specific notes we had on these guys i'll let you go first here and the first guy that you got to speak with today was christian gonzalez correct that's who i think we where we started the day yeah um, so. i left to speak with emmanuel forbes but i want to hear your thoughts and your impressions from from the gonzalez interview so I think he is a, he's one of the top three corners in this draft. There's no doubt about that. His his skills and what he possesses uh, physically and athletically are pretty insane. Um, so I was impressed by that, and will be probably most likely impressed by that. However, his interview I was not so impressed by. Okay. Um, and I think the consensus on him is that he just like has not. Cornerback is kind of a different breed, and we kind of picked sure. up on that, especially today talking with these guys in these interviews. Um, there's kind of this extra gear or drive when it comes to the cornerback position. And I think that the position itself just lends it to that, that you have to be, Oh, you got a chip, chip on your shoulder, constantly working grind mentality, dog mentality. Like that's the culture. It's like the Denny, the, uh, Denny Carter tweet where it's like every quarterback tweet is, I love, I love my teammates. Yeah. Every, every tight end tweet is derp. Every running back tweet is we won, let's go. And then every mm -hmm. wide receiver tweet is. The, the enemy speaks softly and carries a knife yeah. and like that, that there's a vibe to each position and the, the defensive back vibe is a very defined one. Yeah. And it's not like he, he wasn't like 
it, it, it wasn't bad per se. It's just like, I, I didn't see the, the mentality that I want to separate myself from the top of this class, which okay. I know he can do. Um, he has a lot of confidence at the position. And I think personally from a scheme fit, he would be great at the 11th pick for the Titans overall. Um, but personally from a, I wasn't picking up that he would be a great fit for the culture of the, of the Titans. Okay. Yeah. I mean, from a, from a prospect standpoint, he, he he's, He's a stud. He's got it all. He's yeah. 6'2", 201, really fantastic build for a corner. Um, spent four years playing college. No, excuse me, three years in college. A couple of years at Colorado before he transferred to Oregon last year and had a really fantastic season. His final year at Colorado in 2021, PFF grade of 71.2. Last year, a PFF grade of 81.2, a full 10 points better and uh, almost played the same number of snaps, so maintained the the level of play despite increasing his his production or increasing his snap count rather. Crazy movement skills, you know, for his size in particular, he's got fantastic control. That's basically the scouting report on him is that he's got ungodly levels of control despite being a big lanky corner. He he's really super athletic, uh, pushing that athleticism pretty much to the, the extents of, of what are possible. And um, I'm looking here just at my notes on the guy. The, the only cons really are, are that um, he sometimes loses at the catch point. Yeah. He could be a little, he could be a little bit more aggressive. Yeah. Um, maybe a little then, too aggressive. And that, and, that, yeah. and that goes, that goes with just like the mentality of it all. I think he, he knows, he, he knows his game. Well, he clearly knows his game. Cause that's all he would talk about. He's like, I, I'm very confident in my game. Um, I set out to prove some things at, when I left for Colorado from Colorado to go to Oregon. And I think I did that this year. That was like basically the essence of his interview today. And that, we have a clip from that inter- interview, correct? Um, I don't think so. No, not on him. No, just everybody else. Yep. Okay. Well, <laughs> with that, we'll, we'll move on then. Yeah. Uh, the next guy who I spoke to was, let's see, who did we have listed up here next? Clark Phillips, yep. Clark Phillips out of Utah. Clark Phillips, the third had a really I'd say a pretty positive interview with him. It, it didn't, I'll be honest. It didn't stick out to me as the best interview that I, that I've had here, but really great communicator seems like a, a laid back guy, well-spoken guy, very hungry guy. He seems like the kind of guy that is really going to win over coaches in the meeting room, but I don't know a ton about his game. I've not watched a ton of him. I do find him interesting because of the position he's at. Um, on the draft board, as well as the fact that he's a cornerback and this cornerback group is is really talented. He's among those guys. Uh, we have a clip before we talk about him as a prospect from his interview. I asked Clark about in this stacked and deep class, and I asked this to pretty much everybody that I talked to today because I was curious what different answers I would get. My staple question was, what differentiates you? What do you think it is about you as a player? What is it about you, your game that that maybe makes you stick out among the rest of these guys, because there are a ton of really talented folks in this class. And here's what Clark Phillips, the third out of Utah had to say. Um, It starts off with the process, uh, just literally respecting every part of it. Um, I like to say my, my, my style of play is already on film. I'm a ferocious, nasty, relentless, smart, nasty ball hawk. And that's just what I do. Have you met with the Titans? No, sir. No, sir. And Clark, as he said at the end there, had not met with the Titans yet. Um, I, I didn't actually hear from any of the cornerbacks whether or not they'd met with the Titans. Did you? Uh, there was one. I think Darius Rush out of South Carolina was okay. one that well, I know for sure. And that makes sense because Rush is right in that. Uh, he's 101. So yeah, he's right in that, in that area where they could thir- third or fourth round. They may be considering a guy right there. So, and you know, just because a, a player hasn't met with a guy at this point or a player hasn't met with a team at this point, doesn't mean that they're not interested. It could mean that they've just not gotten around to their planned interview yet. The weekend is still not even upon us, um, and the week is young. It also could mean that they are interested, but they uh, met with him at the Senior Bowl already or plan on meeting with him with a formal t- team invite to the facility in the future. So um, it's important to know who has and hasn't met yet, but it's not a deal breaker whether they have or not. The next guy that we met with, and again, I that's the I didn't have a ton to, to say on, on Clark merely because I'm not super familiar with his game. I know that as, as a cornerback, he's highly touted, and I'm sure we'll talk more about him on the show in the future when For we sure. get to some more of those deeper guys. I also didn't get to spend a ton of time 
at his podium because I'm a splitting time between him and another guy who we'll talk about here in a moment, but I won't skip your turn. The next guy that we'll talk about was one of yours, and that's Eli Ricks out of Alabama. Yeah, Eli Ricks is really interesting to me. Um, he started for two years at Alabama and in his freshman year. Maybe he redshirted a year. I'm not um, entirely I'll, I'll sure about that. Here. But yeah. in his first year at LSU, he was very, very good. And his second year, he kind of stayed a little bit consistent with that. Um, maybe fell off just a little bit. Um, in his sophomore year? Yeah. He was actually banged up in his sophomore year. Yeah. So that's the other part of his game is that he's very injury prone. He has suffered a couple injuries in his game uh, and then but came to Alabama and was a pretty decent corner, especially for his build. He is a speedy corner with, he has explosiveness and can keep up with you on the outside. Um, but it was really interesting for him to be here because I think he it could surprise some people. And that's exactly what he said. So we asked him today, um, he's not doing any drills this week, just doing testing and meeting with um, some teams. Right. He's still overcoming that, that injury. I see here he, he, shoulder injury in 21 before he transferred mm -hmm. from LSU to Bama, then a back injury that he's still currently mm -hmm. dealing with. And that's why he's not testing, but you did speak with him. So here's, here's yeah. that clip. Might have a great two straight and I'm shaking back from that. But at Pro Day, I will be doing everything. And uh, I expect to surprise a lot of people, to be honest. I've seen kind of some of the projections on the running and stuff like that. So I think I'm going to surprise some people. And I like that attitude out of him. He's someone who's kind of been um, pushed down boards because of his injury history. But if he can stay healthy, I think he's going to be a diamond in a rough for a, a team. He's such an interesting prospect because he's he's one of those rare guys that started his career in college better than he would ever reach again. An 82.8 PFF grade at LSU as a rookie or a redshirt rookie in 2020. That was the second best at the position in the entire Power Five, again, as a rookie. Um, and then he goes on again to deal with two injury, I guess not riddled because it sounds like there's only one major injury, but two major injuries in the next two seasons before he comes out. They weren't bad. He was in the high sixties with his grade, but he played less snaps. I mean, he's only had 735 snaps in the last two seasons due to that shoulder and back injury. The, the traits are there though. So it's in, careful. Could be a little bit of Caleb Farley situation here. Not to the same extent. He didn't have his back fused or vertebra poked at poked and prodded, but he has had Two significant injuries in two years. Not great for a guy that um, is is a junior coming out of college and has not played a ton of, of football in the last two years compared to some of his some of his fellow cornerback prospects. He is crazy long, and he's got a, a really nice build for a cornerback. You you can basically just create a cornerback in Madden, and that's what this guy looks like. Uh, super fluid for for a taller guy. Another thing that like Christian Gonzalez is a is a plus for him, and he's got a real feel for the route running guys do, anticipating those things, uh, making making the right adjustment to be uh, at the at the place of the ball, even when the scheme offensively is designed to make that guy open. It's supposed to be an easy dump off. Guys like Eli Ricks have been known throughout his career for being there, surprising the quarterback and disrupting the ball. So it, it, it's a really, it's a really difficult prospect in my opinion to evaluate because of the injury history and because he's not played a ton of football recently, but the high end that he demonstrated in 2020 with LSU and the spurts of high end play that we saw at Alabama uh, in the last two seasons, make you consider him pretty significantly. He'll probably end up going on, on day two, I'd be shocked if he didn't. There would have probably been a medical situation there that we're not privy to. But he'll go second or third round, and some team will have a high-risk, high, high risk, high reward prospect in Eli Ricks out of Alabama. Ready to move on? Yeah. All right. The next guy that we talked to, this was my guy, and this was the guy I... I was going to say he's my favorite, but the third guy that I spoke to, I really liked both of these guys. Mm -hmm. And if, if the Titans were to consider either of them, I would be pretty ecstatic. The first one was Emmanuel Forbes out of Mississippi State. Forbes is, uh, well, I, I do have a number of thoughts on him as a prospect, but I also have a number of videos that I, I think are worth showing. So let's start with those. Things for Tyreek Stevenson that you put in your notes there and you switched the two players is what you did. 
I totally did, didn't I? Yeah. That's why I'm so confused. It's I, not have my the, fault, I have the people. I have the wrong notes for the wrong people. Players. This is All not right, my well, fault. While while JT plays these clips from Emmanuel Forbes, cornerback <laughs> yeah. from Mississippi State, I promise, not the guy we just showed you. That guy's Tyreek Stevenson, cornerback from Miami. Manuel Forbes, three videos. And these were the questions that we asked him. I'll correct wait, my wait, notes wait. while we're watching this. Yeah, we, we played the first one. That first one was correct. But that one can, was correct. Okay. We can, we'll just play him again since we have some people in here. Okay. So this is Emmanuel Forbes talking to Easton. That's not. That's Tyreek Stevenson. No, yes. this is Tyreek Stevenson. I promise. Stacked you. group of cornerbacks. He oh. has, they have name cards for a reason. I know, but that's, they were cropped out of the video. What is the first one? Do you have it? Yeah. There, okay, he has it. We have too many videos. Yeah. JT, here's uh, the first question. Stuff I've done in three years and having nobody else put those numbers up. And I'm just going show to show them tomorrow that I can run. Have you met with the Titans? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay, so now that we've got that fiasco out the of the second, way. The second video here, you I, someone, someone asked him about his game and if it relates to another cornerback here in uh, – uh, yes, Trayvon Diggs. So is, just just to, just to finalize the confusion here, I was right. This 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 is in fact Manuel Forbes. Yeah. I confused myself thinking that I'd mix the guys up. I hadn't. So the only guy we've shown you so far is Emmanuel Forbes, not Tyreek Stevenson. We just yes. got the videos mixed up. All right. So that was how he describes himself and how he thinks he's <laughs> distinguishing himself from the rest of the field. Wow, we are having a Thursday at the NFL draft. Can you tell we are tired? But we're going to keep trucking. NFL along Combine, here. by the way. You said NFL draft. It's the Combine for the draft. It's close enough. Yep. <laughs> the next video is him responding to a question. It wasn't from me, but he has been compared to Trayvon Diggs by a number of people mm -hmm. because of the style of play, kind of a former wide receiver style of play in the way that he's going, kind of going for broke sometimes. And that means he can get burnt at times. Uh, it does mean that he is high, high risk, high reward. The rewards fans naturally don't put up a fight about. It's the risks that they have issues with. And uh, that's the case with with both of these guys. Trayvon Diggs, a, a controversial cornerback in the NFL for the Cowboys. This is the uh, the answer, more of a deflection. Hey, don't compare me to this guy. Answer yeah. from Emmanuel Forbes being compared to Trayvon Diggs. When you study. Oh, I do not. He created a lot of turnovers, but uh, we play totally two different types of like corner position, and I like to create turnovers just like him. Yeah. So Key and Peel anger translator translation of that is: Please, I'm begging you, don't compare me to that guy. He's not a good cornerback. He just, he's like he's like <laughs> yes, I make turn I create turnovers. Yes, but I, but. You know, burnt, burnt toast in the dictionary, and yeah. it, it might be Trayvon Diggs, depending on the time of day and the uh, the the day of the week, because he is a little bit inconsistent with that. Uh, Forbes, the biggest thing for me. Oh, I'm sorry. There's one more clip. One more clip. He he had a fantastic Senior Bowl, and so he was asked about that, how he managed to really stand out at the Senior Bowl, turn some heads, and here was his answer to that question. I'm done in three years, having nobody else put those numbers up. And I'm just going to show you to show them tomorrow that I can run. Have you met with the Titans? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay. Now that was, was rough. It was, it was rough, but we got through it. And, and now we're to the part that I have been wanting to talk about. And yeah. that's, that's Forbes as, as a prospect. He's an interesting one. And tomorrow we'll do a better job of numbering our videos. We thought we could just eyeball it but clearly with well, we got like 15 videos we don't know which one is well which. hey now i'm not the one who switched his notes around so i'm not going to take blame for this but we can be okay well i might not be on the show guys <laughs> <laughs> this is going to become a one person set yeah, by tomorrow um be. no but emmanuel forbes is a prospect he's a guy that i really like he's slated to go in that early day two i wouldn't be shocked and i think tomorrow's testing will be a, a big element in figuring out whether or not he slips into the first round there at the end of the day, or is, again, I think that a number of guys like Forbes, who absolutely would be a first-round caliber cornerback in another draft, are going to get pushed back with the traffic jam of cornerbacks into that early second round, and then there's just going to be a round, round-and-a-half run on 10 to 12 of them. If he falls and the Titans manage to get him, I think he'd be a really great guy for them for a number of reasons and not a great guy for them for one very big reason, which I'll get to in a minute. The reasons why I think Forbes will be a really fantastic corner in the NFL, the pros, first of all, and I've said this about every guy, but if one guy stands out among the rest today in terms of their cornerback build, it is Emmanuel Forbes. This dude is freaky lanky. 
I mean, long as the day is in a a sweltering June afternoon. Like it is a guy that you just look at him head to toe and you look up and he keeps going and going and going. But part of that lankiness is he's kind of a stick. He's kind of still a stick despite, I think, trying to put on a little bit of extra weight. He just does not have any body mass to him. He's got to bulk up a little bit. And because he's not bulked up, I mean, he's six foot, but only 180. That's about 10 pounds at least shy of where you'd want your cornerback at that height to be for a team like the Titans because you have to be versatile in in a way that you can be blitzed if they're going to do some disguises up front, if they're going to continue their trend of, of being a team that loves to use these disguised fronts, these simulated pressures. The cornerbacks... If you're playing in the in the slot at all, and sometimes even from the outside, you have to be able to rush, which means you you have to have some muscle to you to be able to bring down the quarterback and maybe slip slip a blocker or two. But even more important than that, if you if you can't hang in the run game, if you can't hang as a tackler, uh, no team's going to want that. But the Titans in particular, they're not going to want to add another defensive back of which they've had a handful in recent years that simply cannot hang in the tackling department cannot be a plus in any way in the run defense with Forbes. I'm not saying that he can't be, but his production so far has been really inconsistent and at times lackluster on both of those fronts. And really, I think that has primarily, if not exclusively to do with the fact that he's really tall and lanky and he's got no size to him. Um, And that, that that's a little bit different than what the Titans have have done in the past where they've gone for a smaller corner Um, like like roger mccreary yeah Yeah, sure so if they they probably can have the opportunity to work on him in that aspect of their game but it would be a definitely philosophical shift for them which it, it might be a time for them to make a shift at the corner position and go for these guys who are a little bit taller and maybe need to put on a little bit more size in the weight department but are someone who's going to play a different style than they have right now because it hasn't really worked out for them. Correct. But what makes Forbes so intriguing outside of that one big downside? And that is the big downside for me. He's the ball hawk of this draft. And this is where the notes confusion came up. I was talking about how he didn't have a lot of ball production when we were dealing with the fiasco with the clips. That's because I was reading my notes for Tyreek Stevenson, who does in fact have ball production issues. We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. With Forbes, he's the polar opposite, which is ironic that I mixed those two up. Um, but he is the ball hawk of this class. 13 interceptions over his career. Four more than the next closest power five cornerback since 2020. He's super, super dominant, particularly in man coverage. Something the Titans have been doing more and more recently. They've in really the last two years with the draft of Caleb Farley and then with the draft last year. Um, they, they, they were going for primarily guys that are, are man coverage studge. Roger McCreary was that guy. Caleb Farley was really productive in man coverage. Um, that seems to be the way that they're wanting to transition this team. And so for that reason, I think Forbes would be a stud. They also need guys that can produce turnovers. There's nothing more valuable in terms of EPA on defense. And it's not even close than turnovers. You sacks are great. They matter a lot, but in terms of EPA, they are dwarfed by getting the ball for your offense. And so that's why guys like Trayvon Diggs, for example, the ball hawks get away with being crappy corners a lot of the time because if you create those turnovers, you make up for your mistakes. If you get burnt, but you burn the other team by taking the ball away, a lot of teams are willing to turn a blind eye to that and say, you know, no, you, you made up for it. No harm, no foul. With Forbes, he... He, he just he caught everything that came his way last year. He's got really, really amazing ball skills. All six of his interceptions came in man coverage, by the way. The, the biggest con really is just the fact that he's not the most versatile uh, in the run game and as a tackler. Yeah, I, I think he's someone that can definitely develop into that. But they, the Titans, outside of someone like a Kevin Byard on his best seasons, have not had that threat to take away and always have the opportunity to create turnovers. Yeah. So let's go to the last guy that you got to see, uh, or sorry, second to no third to last guy. You got three, three more guys that you want to talk about. So let's cover two of them real quick. Yeah. Well, you want to start well, with, let's do the two guys out of South Carolina. Okay, so cool. That, yep. Um, so, so start with Cam Smith. Yeah. Let's start with Cam Smith. I don't have a video for Cam Smith, but just 
something I want to touch on. Maybe here. a good thing based on our track record. Yeah, so far. right. Um, he did say today, I think if you're a Vols fan out there, he, the his biggest competition that he played this past season was Jalen Hyatt. Um, and he says that gave me the really opportunity to go up against some money in the schedule that he had, which wasn't very good. Um, when I was looking back at it, I was like, I, you, he, he made, he made you a comment over to me and you said, look at this schedule. And I uh, said, what is this dog? Yeah. He, he said basically along the lines of, he really was the only competition that I had all season Jalen and Hyatt. I, and Jalen yeah. Hyatt. And I was like, is he just saying that? Or like, what is he saying regarding that? And it's just like, I was curious, but then I went in and I was like, oh no, the, as far as draft talent this year goes, they, he really is the only competition. But the big thing about Cam Smith is, is that he could go as far as t- the twenty second overall pick on some big boards, super and, wide range, and definitely fall as far as fifty six to sixty range. And it's because he's probably the. You said earlier, cornerback takes knowledge of the game and then the physical Peak ability, physical athleticism. Yep. Cam Smith is the best cornerback in this class when it comes to smarts, he sees the game like no, no other cornerback is going to see like a quarterback of the defense really is the he way that really I've heard is. multiple people would describe him. However, the traits are just not, he, he's, he's around an average size for a corner. So nothing really stands out there. It's just his, the traits that he had in what he showed in his college career were not anything to write home about. Yeah, so he beats yeah. you by knowing the game rather than physical ability. Yeah, he's he's a guy that I I like, but I'll be honest, he he's kind of kind of a victim of being a little bit boring in relation to the rest of this class. There's not in what I've watched and read on him so far. There's not anything that sticks out to me. I think he's going to be a good starter, but th- he's he's not he's not got that thing that you're like, ooh, that separates me from the crowd. That that is that makes me be interested in you above the other forty cornerbacks in the same kind of area in this draft and it sounds like if i'd been there to ask him my question of the day he wouldn't he he would have come up with something but in reality i'm not sure there would have been a very good answer because i'm not sure there's much that differentiates cam smith from the, yeah, from the but he's an crowd absolute. outside of maybe just the model of consistency and a safe choice yeah he's an absolute wild card though some team could absolutely fall in love with him sure. and fit their scheme and he could have fall as far as maybe a third round pick because of just the traits that he possesses. You want to move on to Darius rush? Yeah. Darius rush. Um, I didn't ask him any questions myself, but I was just there to just listen because I think both of these prospects out of South Carolina are pretty interesting Mm -hmm. this season. And one that I got from, um, from Lucas Panzika, he posted this on Twitter earlier that I thought was really interesting is someone asked, uh, Darius Rush, what his best part of his game this past season was and like where he excelled. And it's a really fascinating yeah, game. So like, I would say probably my special teams, honestly. Really? Yes, definitely. Because like I started, so after the switch in 2019, I made my, I made plays on special teams. So that's why I started. So I always, you always remember where you come from. So I came from special teams. I embody special teams, honestly. And I just use that as my motivation is, okay, once you get your special teams, get the defense. So 2019, we played a little bit of special teams. 2020 started on all four phases. Uh, then 21 and 22, as became a starter, but I'm still playing on special teams. So I'd say special teams really played a big role in my, part of my game because there's so many aspects that you can do on special teams and then um, the different technique that you also have on special teams that correlates to defense as well. Special teams, you say? I in my whoop, whoop. in my notes here. I literally in my notes. I whoop, whoop. I wrote wee woo wee woo, perfect Titan, <laughs> perfect alert, Titan alert. Because who did the Titans not love more than making their draft picks put play those on rookies the, put the rookies on, on the line the, and make them run the, down there, baby? Yep. It's special teams time. That's yeah. really all I had to say about him. I think he has he's kind of the exact opposite of Cam Smith in which he has better traits, but he, his skill and his knowledge of the game is not like on his level so they they're two very different corners i just think currently he's sitting around the one 101 pick uh in on the consensus board could be there on the on the third round for the titans right the the last guy that i spoke to today and we've got two more one from me one from jt uh it's tyreek stevenson out of miami who i i'm so annoyed that i flubbed this up earlier 
because I really, really, really loved Tyreek Stevenson today and I enjoyed his answers. And you're going to get a little bit extra than uh, you bargained for because we've already played one of them on accident. We'll play it again. But with Stevenson, I asked him once again. This is the first video, I'm pretty sure. He he was asked by me, what makes him different? How does he differentiate himself from the stacked class? Stacked group of cornerbacks in this draft, really deep group. How do you differentiate yourself? What do you think your game uh, – how, how does your game separate you from the others? Uh, I feel like a lot of talented people here, you know, just like you said, a lot of talented group, uh, a lot of CVs in this group. Uh, just me, um, I just feel like I'm a dog, and I feel like I could – you know, present myself at any position in the back end, you know, any corner, any side, any safeties, and eventually nickel, or you need, you need me to out slide in the box and play linebacker. So I feel like I'm just, you know, be able to play any position. The next question I had for him was along the lines of the criticism that I accidentally laid out earlier. But the criticism for him has been, and I think is from, from what I've seen at least, the ball tracking just isn't, it, it, it ain't there for him. He doesn't have that skill like the other guys do. And he also doesn't really have the ball skills that other corners have his ability to, you know, just the, the ball production, you would have liked a little bit more. And so I asked him if you were to field the criticism of, which is pro move, by the way, don't criticize a player at the podium. Say, if you were criticized in this way, what would you say? What would your response be? And that's what I asked. If I were to say your ball production is lacking, how would you respond? Uh, to be honest, you know, the ball, the ball, you know, eventually finds you as a cornerback, and I have to do a better job on my, um, on my ball catcher skills. But at the same time, I'm doing my job. You know, we want the ball, but at the same time, you know, we get paid to deflect the ball as much. So, the last clip from him is a clip of Tyreek Stevenson talking about. Uh, the fantastic year that he had at the Senior Bowl and how he managed to put up such an impressive performance. My approach is, you know, I'm finna go out to the line. I feel like my preparation and how I train and how I lock in on myself and critique myself is going to give me advantage out of the line of scrimmage. But I just want to go there and earn some respect, put my best foot forward. So just up on that upcoming, I stopped my combine training and started back getting in a um, football shape and started back working on my football stuff. So I feel like it gave me a slight advantage there. The thing about Stevenson that I really like, and he's an interesting evaluation as well, because his history is a little bit muddled. There are some questions there that need answering, and it's the kind of thing that could mean the difference. And we may never know the answer to some of these questions. In fact, we won't know the answer to some of these questions. But the things that he talks to coaches and GMs behind closed doors about in terms of his history and the way that they evaluate his answer on, on those questions will mean a lot for whether or not he goes at the beginning of the second round or the beginning to the middle of the fourth round. Like it's pretty wide, the range of outcomes, I think, even though most have him in that firm second, maybe third round area, there's a chance that his history turns some people off. And I guess I'll start there because I'm already halfway down the road. Stevenson, it's not, I don't mean to insinuate he's a bad guy or has a rough history, but from a competitor's standpoint, there's some questions as to whether or not he can hang with the big boys because he started out spent two years with Georgia and they were playing him mostly in the slot he wanted to play outside but he couldn't really hang outside two lackluster years there after being a top 40 recruit in the 2019 class then he transferred to Miami did two years there even though he's listed as a junior. I guess, I'm assuming that's because of the COVID year. That one year wiped off the boards, added back the year of eligibility. So he's only played three tracked years of football um, by the NCAA, but four full seasons, two with Georgia, two with Miami. And in Miami, he's been fantastic. An 84.8 coverage grade is uh, what he put up in 2021, which was second among ACC cornerbacks. In 2022, he had his best overall year in terms of a PFF grade, 76.7 on almost 600 snaps and almost 300 coverage snaps. He allowed just under 400 yards, excuse me, just over 350 yards on those almost 300 coverage snaps, 17 receptions on 40 targets, uh, three touchdowns and two interceptions for a 42.5% completion ranking. Re completion percent rather really really good year for a guy that at six foot 214 entirely different from any other cornerback that we've talked to or about today 
he is a, a different build. You can see it just in the video. He looks more like a guy like, you know, you may cross his path and say, is that a wide receiver or is that a cornerback or maybe it's a safety? No, it's a cornerback. 214 at six foot is a thicker guy for a cornerback, but that stout build for a corner allows him to do, again, uh, what we were cr critiquing other corners for. He can impose his will on guys in tackling, in you know, defending against blocking and, and uh, being able to get after the, the, the passer as well as get after it in the run game from a defensive standpoint. So that, that build lends itself to the kind of guy that I think the Titans would be really interested in. It's two sides of the coin. I guess what I'm saying is if the, if you could combine Tyreek Stevenson and Emmanuel Forbes, he'd be the perfect, really he'd be exactly what the Titans are looking for. But if I had to pick which one they would prefer, just knowing the Titans, I think they would prefer Stevenson because he already can hang in the more physical elements of the sport. And this defense, if nothing else, is defined by their physicality. The last uh, corner here that we talked to today was a pretty interesting one because he's uh, lower on a lot of people's boards. And it's because of one reason. We're going to talk here about Travius Tomlinson. Which Who is 122 on the consensus he's board, 122. by the way. So this is the lowest guy on the board that we've talked to today. But I think his his stock can really rise for him. He was last season. He plays for TCU and he won the Jim Thorpe Award this past season, which is given out for the best defensive back play in college football. So he does have that skill. The, the only problem really is that it's it's his build. He's 5'9 and 180, which is, if you're going to try to play the outside on a bigger receiver, it, it's just not going to work out well for you. No. And it was very apparent when he came to the podium that, that he looked a little different than everybody else. He was definitely the smallest, definitely the yes. leanest of all of the corners out there. And that's probably why he's so low. He's just a concern for a couple of these teams to take him any higher than he is listed right now, because right. how is he going to fare against those big bodied receivers? It's tough, man. With that build, it is, what did you, did you say exactly how tall and, and yeah, he's five, nine, one eighty. Yeah. Five, nine, one. I was about to say he's either five, eight or five, nine. It's probably more on the five, eight side, but five, nine, one eighty for a cornerback in the NFL. It's definitely slot only. And he's going to be fighting for his life against some of these guys that, as we see wide receivers in the NFL, increasingly be put on the inside, even though they are the Cooper Cups and the um, De DeAndre Hopkins of the yeah. world. Like they, they're putting these star guys in the slot to exploit guys like this. Frankly, yeah. he, it's really interesting because in his in his past season he played wide and had his best PFF grade there, seventy eight point three. That's just not something that's sustainable in going into the NFL and he played only 29 snaps at the slot, but still had a very respectable grade of 77.7. So it's not like he can't do it. It's just going to be a lot more difficult for him. Yep. All right. Is that it? Are yeah, that's covered? it. All right. So those are the guys we talked to today. We have a couple more things to talk about before we get out of here. And those are the testing numbers that we got today from the edge linebacker and defensive lineman who again, kicked off the athletic testing in Lucas Oil Stadium for the Combine. Really just a couple of tidbits to talk about here that we had some impressors and at least one really underwhelming performance. But impressive was Northeastern Edge. Adetomiwa, Adebowari, Adebowari. I'm going to get out the actual pronunciation Adibawari, guide. Is it, it Adebowari? I believe so. I can tell you for sure it is. Adetomiwa, Adibare. Yes, Adibare. Adi, Adibare. So... Uh, Adi Tamiwa put up a four, five flat 40, despite being six, two, two eighty. It's just crazy, man. Ridiculous, ridiculous time for a guy that has skyrocketed up the consensus board. He's risen nearly 80 spots on the consensus board from the one teens to let's see where he's all the way up to now. I think he's up to almost the first round. They've got him. Where is Adi Bariwa? Okay, maybe not quite that far. I think last time I checked, he was around the mid seventies. Mid seventies. Yeah. There okay. Is, yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I had it wrong. He's climbed from the. Oh, excuse me. He's <laughs> he's climbed from the one uh, seventies all the way, way to the seventies. Yeah. So not eighty spots climbing. 
a hundred spots climbing. Uh, that's pretty significant for a guy that is, I think, going to continue to climb if he continues to test this well. But a four or five, really, the the thing that stuck out was weight two eighty. Yeah, forty official four point five. He was flying out there. Man. He was flying. Another guy that was flying was Byron Young. This one, not the best time of the day, but a guy that sticks out for the Tennessee connection, Tennessee linebacker Byron Young, who we spoke to yesterday and spoke about a little bit, put up a 4 5 one, 40. Really impressive. Even more impressive, though. How about Nolan Smith, linebacker, yeah. out of, edge linebacker out of Georgia, putting up a 4 3 9. Congratulations, Nolan Smith. You are a first-round draft pick in yeah. the 2023 Combine because – that's ridiculous. That's official, by the way. That time is official. Locked in already. Four three nine for a two hundred and seventy pound edge player. Um, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's a ridiculous time that that wide receivers will run and you'll be happy with. But I, I even even though um, Adabare uh, raised his stock, someone who kind of was like sh- overshadowed today yes. is the last guy on here yeah. because I've never seen a guy rise through the boards like he did. Today. I was about to say when I, when I mixed up the numbers, I just realized this is the show of Easton mixing up two guys. It's Kalaja Kansi. He's the guy that has risen nearly 80 spots all the way. He is all the way almost into the first round. Is that not correct? Yeah. I think on, uh, at least on PFF's board, they have him all the way up, which th- is how it caught my eye here. I believe he's around 31, 32, something like that. He's 33 on the on the big consensus board here, um, but on PFF's board, he's around the 13th uh, player overall, which is really interesting. And I was like, hey, we got to keep our eye on this guy because if PF, PFF likes him, he he could rise even farther. There he is, I found him. Yeah, so he went yeah. to Pitt, defensive lineman. By the way, this is even an edge player. Pitt line or defensive lineman Kalaja Kansi has risen the consensus board from the mid one teens all the way to 34th on the board. And it's because I, of I his 40 times. It, well, anyway, it's because of that and a number of things. I mean, he's just he's a traits guy that as people realize the production wasn't the greatest in college, but these traits are ridiculous. And it's the kind of thing that, and again, he was good at Pitt. He didn't have a bad season. He just didn't blow anybody away to the point that he was going to be, you know, a, an early 100s overall pick. It's good, it's a good player, but a great player with the great traits who can run again, what a four was a four. Yeah, he ran a 4.67 40, four, which, six, is, seven, which 40. set the record for defensive lineman. defensive lineman since that has been held since I believe 2003, which was in the article. And he topped Aaron Donald's time of 4.68, which he posted in 2014. So fellow Pitt alumni there just outdoing him barely. But he he looked good in every single drill that he did the the four the pylon drill everything out there he was one of the guys who was always on his feet not slipping a lot he had that explosiveness and he's going to go in the first round most likely yeah a couple of other late breaking ones and again there's probably even more that we've missed that we'll yeah. talk about tomorrow Nolan Smith uh, excuse me we already talked about Nolan Smith I meant to say Jack Campbell my boy D- different linebacker your guy Jack Campbell who we talked to and about on yesterday's show. Uh, out of Iowa, ten foot eight broad jump, the ninety fifth percentile, and uh, he's he's going to be a guy that continues to rise up the boards. One more note is for Ivan Pace Jr. Random have not talked about Ivan Pace. I don't even know where on the consensus board he's slated to go, but he was one of the more disappointing folks at the uh, the testing today. The athletic testing numbers came out for him five ten and a half for Ivan Pace Jr. 231 pounds, and he's a, a linebacker, by the way. Arm length of 30 and one-fourth, hand size of nine and a half. But it's that 30 and one-fourth arm length that I want you to pay attention to because this is a stat courtesy of our bud, Austin Gale, friend of the show, coincidentally, guy that we're going to, I think, link up for dinner with after this. So maybe we'll have him on the show again sometime soon this spring. We'd love to have him back on. Austin Gale over at The Ringer, he tweeted out a couple of minutes ago that every off-ball linebacker with under 31-inch arms and 600-plus snaps played in a single season in the last three years. So basically every off-ball linebacker with short arms that have played full, like they're actual starters. These are guys that can play and be reliable starters for you. David Long, know that guy. Eric Wilson, Troy Reader, Landon Roberts, and Anthony Walker. Not murderers row. No, David Long Jr. is the kind of guy that is a more of an outlier, and we've considered him such since he's been here. 
but it is that size. It's not just his arm length, but overall his smaller frame that leads to what is the number one problem we have with David Long Jr. And the reason that if he's not staying around, the reason the Titans don't pay him is because he's getting injured all the time. And and size has something to do with your, you know, your proclivity to be injured. That's something that these guys consider the smaller guys you wonder coming out. Will they be able to hang up or will they, or will they be able to hang or will they have to hang it up because they, they, they can't stay healthy. So those are the folks that we, that we had at the athletic testing so far today that stood out again, we'll have more to talk about. And I'm really, really looking forward to when we get the, um, when we get to the quarterbacks and the wide receivers, I, I think our camera may have just gone, but I'm going to continue talking because I know you can still hear me. Uh, a lot of guys like we'll talk to probably Quentin Johnston. He, they, he met with the Titans. Yes. We'll ask him how Official he media. did. Yep. And we're back. We got the camera. That's we are great. back. Uh, this, awesome. this has been a show that has been not a comedy of errors, but there've been a couple, but you know what? Through adversity, we, That's character. we, we move, it we've, character. we've built character. Hopefully uh, it's gotten your attention. If, back. If, if we were yeah. making you nod off a little bit there, we got your attention with our handful of technical errors today, but you know, it happens. Mm -hmm. Batteries, mm -hmm. batteries die sometimes. And that's why you have backups so that you can finish the show. And we are going to finish the show because yeah. that's not, all we... not before we talk about the trash can incident. Oh, I forgot about the trash can incident. So Mike Garofolo, who you might know, national media member covering the NFL for a long time and doing so very, very well. Big fan of Mike Garofolo. I tweeted out yesterday a picture of Mike um, essentially just sitting in the middle of the walkway on just radio. Literally Row. in the middle of just, radio. He grabbed Row. himself a folding chair and decided we're going to park right here, dead center. I mean, if you walk into Radio Row down the main strip, the first thing you saw at that time of day was Mike Garofolo sitting behind a trash can, a big brown trash can that he dragged over from the corner of the convention center to the middle of the room to use the lip of for uh, placing his phone so that he could do an interview. At the time, I didn't know what interview. Um, but it happened to be with Around the NFL, the number one NFL podcast in the world, uh, produced by NFL Network, with Dan Hansis and uh, Hansus and all or, all of those guys that do a fantastic job. Um, but but it's a show that's produced by Justin Graver. And if you're familiar with Broadway sports at all, then you know Justin Graver, buddy of ours, friend of the show, uh, a friend of mine personally, and he uh, he produces the show for them. And so when he saw my tweet about Garofolo with the picture of him doing that. He had to put together a video for around the NFL because little did I know on the show, Garofolo was talking about and acknowledging how ridiculous his setup was and how people were looking at him. And uh, he just so happened to notice me noticing him and they put it in this video and our, our buddy uh, managed to Justin Graver managed to get my tweet in that social clip on the around the NFL podcast uh, Instagram page. So here's, Here's that video, the culmination from the only angle you've not gotten, uh, Mike Garofolo's perspective of what was going on with the, the trash. And he can, can stretch this thing out to the point where he gets, I mean, I'm being laughed at right now for my trash can. Uh, and they're all taking pictures. There's going to be so many tweets. There's going to be so many tweets. Albert Breer thinks it's funny. Scott Fitterer thinks it's funny. Sam Monson tweeted something earlier. He thinks it's funny. Somebody out of the corner of my eye, I didn't see who it was, thought it was funny. Another person's taking a picture. You know what? This is fine. This is going to be the most hotly viewed episode because of all this promotion. Mike, tell them you're on the most popular NFL podcast in the world. So, Mike, I'm Guy out of the corner of your eye that you didn't notice or didn't know. That's me. Nice to meet you. Big fan. Um, but, but yeah, that was the trash can incident and just, just a funny non sequitur, uh, from a funny little, yeah. funny little, uh, thing that happened. A little, funny little thing that happened. There's a lot, there's a lot of funny little things that happened in Indy so far this week. I'm sure even more will be happening and some that we probably may or may not be able to talk about. Um, but it's, it's been a great week and it's going to be an even better week when we get to really the bread and butter of the weekend coming up here. So we'll, we'll preview that and then we will get out of here tomorrow. We've got. Like we said, quarterbacks, quarterbacks wide and wide receivers. Big, big day for Bryce. They, I get why they put both positions on the same day for Friday. It's, you know, it's, you, you put the, the big show on the weekend. I understand. Yeah. I still wish as somebody that selfishly is here all week, that they maybe space those out a little bit. Cause that's a lot. Is there going to be multiple days worth of things to talk about for tomorrow? We'll have to boil it down and try to capture everything, but I don't even have to list off the guys that we're going to get to see tomorrow. 
from the quarterback position. Of course, we'll be paying attention to Young and Stroud and Levis and Richardson. We'll talk to Hendon Hooker, um, who is here to speak. He's obviously still not yet doing the physical activities. And then the most important one, Stetson Bennett. Of oh, and then, yeah, we'll for sure be talking to Stetson Bennett. And then on the wide, wide receiver front, uh, we'll make sure to mix and match our top guys Quentin with Johnson for with, sure. Yeah, the Quint- guys. Yeah, the, the guys the Titans might consider at the top of the draft. Quentin Johnson, probably Jordan Addison out of USC, JSN, Jackson Smith, and Jigba out of Ohio State. Both of the Titans or Titans, Tennessee guys that a lot of Tennessee and Titans fans want to see a little uh, in state connection there with Jalen Hyatt. Um, he'll for sure be a guy we talked to, Cedric Tillman. Of course, we'll talk to and then some guys further on down the board. If the Titans were to make maybe a day two or three selection of wide receiver that you should be paying attention to Josh Downs and Zay Flowers. Um, Rasheed Rice will for sure speak with Marvin Mims. Tyler Scott is a guy that I'm pretty high on and I don't think people are really talking about. Um, Puka Nakua, our guys shout out Zach Lyons. And Stoney Keeley, the the guy that they fell in love with down at the Senior Bowl. We're going to see what the hype is about with Puga Nakua out of BYU. Jonathan Mingo, a guy that we are really high on. Our guy TD, who is here, Teron Davenport. He's really high on him out of Ole Miss. There's a lot of really interesting guys later. Trey Tucker out of Cincinnati. A lot of guys we'll get to talk to you tomorrow. The the note take. I mean, we, uh, uh, I'm going to have to mentally prepare myself for tomorrow because the number of notes that we're going to have to take to be well organized for the show is very high, but yeah. I can guarantee you that that's where we'll be. The level of this show is just going to continue to rise. And it really matters. Too. We, and we, we're going to show up in the big moments. We're a, yeah. we're a clutch gene show uh, with, the, with the throwaway shows always have been. It's just the culture. The it's the show, culture but... we're building. It's not a, th- no, we've been, we've been battling the adversity in this show. Yeah. Clutch players battle through adversity. And then after an adverse game, they come back. And they proved that they're still that guy. That's what we're doing tomorrow. So we hope that you'll join us again. Thank you so much if you're listening to us live, tuning into these live. It's awesome to be able to chat with you guys and have a live audience every single day. Appreciate you immensely. Make sure if you did listen live to still subscribe to the show, wherever you get your podcasts, as well as on YouTube, Broadway Sports Media on YouTube. Search it up. Subscribe on YouTube. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. And then go and leave us a five-star rating takes 10 seconds or fewer of your life, and it means so much more to us than it does to you. I'd consider it a personal favor, so please go and do that. And while you're at it, leave a review. Write whatever you want. We'll see it eventually, and then we'll be able to shout you out on the show, which we love to do. We promise any five-star review, we will read that review on air no matter what it says. So this is the opportunity to get a free shout-out or say something crazy and hear it on your favorite podcast. That's it for today. We're going to go rest up, get ready for tomorrow. Meet up with with Austin, Gale, some of the ringer guys maybe, and uh, do a little networking and talk about all that we have to see tomorrow with the quarterbacks and the receivers. Every time I say it, I get a little nervous because it's, man, there's a lot, there's there's a lot. lot to do tomorrow. We're going to bring it all to you. We'll be back tomorrow afternoon with all of that and more. This has been the Hot Read Podcast. I'm your host, Easton Freeze, for producer JT. Have a great night. We'll talk to you on Friday.